If you have your Bibles today, open them up to uh, Romans chapter 6. And so we're going to be uh, looking at some things. I, I, I uh, have one of the uh, Sunday school uh, lesson, the teacher's book that they've been in. I think it started uh, in John, and there was a quote I, I'm sure that was brought up in the Sunday school, but I want to uh, read this for those that maybe weren't here, didn't hear this. I think the, the focus on the Sunday school lessons is about um, Christ's life in John and and I think that today they focused on live selflessly, uh, live as Christ lived, and how he came and uh, he didn't promote self, he came and he came uh, to serve, and rather uh, to be served. And so uh, there was a quote in there that said, Jesus called his followers to be radically different from the culture of Christianity prevalent in today's world. Uh, I think the shift is uh, in churches today, and the mindset is is getting further and further away from original uh, ministry that Christ established. Uh, uh, Worldly-minded believers too often look for a church that meets their needs rather than one where they can give themselves in sacrificial ministry for others' sake. I thought that was a good quote out of the Sunday school lesson today because uh, many times when we, we look for a church or we come to church, it's more about what does the church have to offer for us. But really, if we're to live as Christ, it's saying, well, what can we do for that church? Where can we fit in? What can we do in our lives to make an impact on others? Because that's what Christ did. He, he came and lived a life selflessly uh, to give uh, his life, and, and not only just in the way that he lived, but ultimately on the cross, to make an impact on others. And you sitting in here today, uh, as a child of God, as a born-again believer, uh, Christ made an impact on your life, to the point where you're now a child of, of God, a son or daughter of the King. And so uh, our ministry is the same as Christ's ministry, uh, to, to a selfless ministry, to, to serve rather than to be served, to, uh, to look more towards what can we do for others than what can those others do for us. And so that's the mindset that we uh, need to have and it kind of tied along with the, the message today. I didn't um, really plan on this, but in Romans 6, there, there is a, a cost. Uh, uh, Christ uh, says, come and follow me. Now, if you're up on the latest and latest, you've got Twitter and you've got Facebook and all this other stuff. And, and, and Twitter, it's all about getting people to follow you on Twitter. And, and, and I, as superstars, they have millions of followers. And they're just waiting to see what they, they, they text or they tweet. And, and people follow that, and they get updates. And, and so I, I don't understand that, but uh, that's not here to say, to say it's wrong. But uh, millions and millions of people follow certain individuals just to see what they have to type or text or, or, or to follow. And, and this following Christ is nothing like what we have an idea today. Uh, following somebody on Twitter or following somebody on Facebook has nothing to do with how we're to follow Christ. Keeping tabs on someone is not the following that Christ intended for us to do. Uh, we are to follow Him in our lifestyle. Follow Him in a way that when we live, it's evident in our life that we follow Jesus Christ. But we're living the life that He lived, that He set as a standard. And so uh, there's not a lot of teaching today in churches today on holiness. It's, it's a topic that nobody wants to touch because uh, it tends to drive people away. It, it tends to challenge people. It tends to uh, step on people's toes to the point where it's uncomfortable. And so, uh, listen, it's not me. It's God's Word today. And so it's, it's about living a holy life because that's the way Christ lived. He, he came and set the standard. His standard was without sin. His standard was to be a servant, to, to serve. He's coming back as king. But while he was here on this earth and set the standard, he set the standard for us to follow him and there is a cost to follow him today but when it comes about removing sin from our life that's not to be looked at as a cost that's to be looked at as a freedom that Christ has given us over sin you see we're not shackled to sin anymore if we're a child of God there's been a freedom that was attained on the cross of Christ that's to free us from sin and so there's a confusion and and, and many people take Paul's work and Paul focused a lot about grace uh, and, and we know grace, and we're quick to say grace. And it is by the grace of God that we're saved. It's by the grace of God uh, and His mercy that Christ came and died on the cross. But we confuse a grace uh, that's talked about in the Bible with, with a grace that we want to fit our lifestyle, that, that we want to justify some things in our life. And, and listen, today we're going to focus on uh, clearing that up because, listen, it's grace that God didn't just squash us in our sin. It's His mercy and grace that, that He allowed us to, to, to live 
forgiven our sin and, 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 and to keep drawing us and keep uh, giving us a chance. And every breath that we drew as a lost sinner, we uh, were living under the, the grace of God and His mercy. But then when we came to know Him and we gave in and, and we repented of our sin, we become a child of God. There's still a grace that we live in, but it's not this grace that many people have an idea of uh, in the world today. And maybe what's even being preached behind pulpits today. Listen, there, uh, there's a, a, a type of life that God has called His children to live. As citizens of America, we live a certain way because we're citizens of America. Listen, as citizens of, of heaven, we're commanded to live a certain way to reflect our citizenship. Listen, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that, that grace may abound? Paul's addressing an issue here. He's, he's speaking in hypotheticals. He's asking a question, but then he's responding. Uh, because maybe this is some questions that was being posed to him in his teachings of grace. What he was saying is, listen, for someone who's been forgiven of much, there's a lot of grace there. God's grace is, is unlimited when it comes to forgiving and pardoning of sin. Uh, so he's saying no matter what your sin was, no matter how much you had, there's a grace and there's a forgiveness for that sin. And he's saying that the greater the sin, the, the greater the grace that covers that. And so there was the question, well, if grace is, uh, should we continue in sin that we can receive that God's grace? And he's saying, no, don't twist this into something that gives you a license to sin. Uh, don't twist this into something that um, eases the conviction of something in your life because nothing in the Word of God uh, would ever ease a conviction of sin. Uh, that's contrary to the work of the Holy Spirit. That's contrary to what God's Word is about. Verse 2, he says, certainly not. He says, no, heaven, heaven forbid you would even think that. He says, how should we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's a good question. That's a good question Christians need to ask every day. That's a good question that needs to be posed behind more pulpits today. Listen, how can Christians who profess to know Christ, who is supposed to have died to sin, live any longer in it? He says, verse 3, Or do you not know, as many of us were baptized into uh, Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Listen, Christ died on the cross because of sin. Because of our sin. Your sin, my sin, the sin of the world. It was sin that, that Christ had to die on the cross. And, and when the, the uh, darkness came and the, the hour drew near and, and Christ shouted, it's finished, and, and he gave up the ghost, there was a, a momentary uh, appearance of victory of sin. And so there was a momentary victory uh, appearance that, that sin had overcame. And, but Christ had to die. He had to make that sacrifice so that the victory could be given. You see, through the death came the victory. Uh, it was only through Christ's death, His burial, and His resurrection that we have victory over sin and death. Notice it's not just over death. We always say, well, as Christians, we have victory over death. And my hope is that when I die in Christ, because I've, I've, I've trusted in Him, that uh, I have victory over death. And uh, when I draw my last breath here, I'll step into the other side of eternity and be in His presence. That is the promise of God. But listen, that's, that's half the victory. The other victory is while we're here. We have victory over this thing called sin because Christ died on the cross. And, and he, he gives us His Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And He says, that we were uh, died together with him. And then verse 5 says, For if we have been united together. I skip verse 4, go back. Therefore we were buried with him. Look at verse 4. I don't want to skip this. This is important. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That's what the picture of baptism is. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of you uh, going down into the water as Christians uh, who's professed Christ goes down into the water and when you come up, uh, that old man, that, that old lifestyle, that old sin that you were uh, shackled to, that, that stuff's now, you've been freed from that. And so that stays, uh, that you, you rise again, uh, a new creation. Uh, it says that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, listen, how do we walk? He says we should walk in a newness of life. As a child of God, as a Christian, we, there should be something different about us that causes a new... It's a rebirth. 
Isn't that what Jesus said? Except a man be born again. And so this, this born again is to be something different, not to be the same. Uh, many people make a mouth profession and they go through the act of baptism, but there's never a new birth. There's never a change in their life. There's, there's never anything that reflects that anything's different in their life. But see, it says here in verse 4 that we should walk in a newness of life. We've been given a new life through Christ. We've been given a new life through the, 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 the blood that was shed on the cross, through His death and His resurrection. And, and if we profess and repent of our sins and, and call upon Him and, and through baptism, it says that we should walk in a newness of life because we've been reborn. It's a brand new day. It's a brand new life that we're starting. And so our walk should reflect that. Verse 5 says, For if we've been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. See, he says that there's something in you uh, that your life should be changed. Now, yes, I know it's not an instantaneous change. I know that, that someone there, you, it's just like a baby. Uh, a baby does not come out of the womb speaking. A baby does not come out of the womb eating meat. Uh, there's a growth process. There is a, 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 a physical growth. And so as a, as a person who is a, a babe in Christ, there is a growth process there. But listen, uh, that child that is being reared is challenged by their parents. Uh, uh, they're challenged to learn. They're challenged to do things. They're given chores uh, all to build them, to grow them. Listen, if, if as Christians today we're not being challenged to do better, we stop growing. If we're not challenging ourselves through the Word of God to live a better life, we stop growing spiritually. And so today is a challenge through the Word of God to continue wherever you are in your growth process. Listen, the only day that you'll say, I have arrived, is either when you draw your last breath and you wake up on the other side of eternity or Christ comes back. Until then, we are growing. And yes, there are different levels that people are at spiritually, but the, the challenge is, is never to stop growing. And if someone ever uh, says it's okay to stay where you're at, it's okay to uh, justify a few sins in your life, it's okay to do this, you need to run from them because they're not challenging you to grow. They're not challenging you from the Word of God. They're not holding you accountable as the Word of God says we are to do because verse 6 says, knowing this that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. That old man, that body of sin, it's done away with. It's not hung up on a coat rack, put in the closet, and pulled back every now and then. It's done away with. It's dead. It's buried. It's gone. With that, we should no longer be slaves to sin. Verse 6 finishes up that we should be no longer slaves of sin. Verse 7 says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. You see that picture? That's our freedom of this earth. Freedom from sin. We're not bound to that sin. Uh, we're, not, we're not chained to that anymore. We've been given a freedom. We've been given victory over that. Now, what does that victory mean? Does that victory mean I can just continue in that? Is that the victory you talked about? I can remain in that sin, and I'm no longer bound to the pits of hell to live in that sin because Jesus granted a freedom on the cross? No, that's, that's the, uh, what the Bible talks about is, is making a mockery of what Christ did on the cross. Christ didn't die on the cross to allow you to live in a sin. That's not freedom because he clarifies, he says, if I'm still attached to something, I'm still a slave to that. Uh, Christ died to break the bondage of that sin. That we should be no longer slaves to that sin. Because there's going to be a new change inside of us. Verse 7 says, for he who has died has been freed. Freed from that sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. If you profess to have died with Christ... If you profess with your mouth that you are a child of God, if you profess uh, that, that you know Him that through death and, and, and through the baptism and through repentance of your sin, if you profess this, then it says you should also live with Him. In, in your life, it should reflect Christ in your life, in your actions, in your words, in everything that we do. This is what the term holiness comes in, because if you have Christ inside of you, there's going to be a difference between you and the world. There's going to be something that's set apart, because everything that's in and of the world is, is not in, uh, in and of Christ. Verse 10 says, or verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but, for, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. And then here's another challenge, verse 11. To Christians, likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love to flip that verse around. If you flip that verse around, if you're alive to sin, then you reckon yourself dead to God. 
See, if the verse reads one way, it has to be true the other way. So if we're dead to sin and alive to God, then the opposite would also be true. To be alive to sin, to be living in sin, to be walking in sin, is to have no fellowship with God. Verse 12 says, Therefore, do not let. Do not let. Those three little words. Who's in charge there? Who's he speaking to? If... If, if I told someone, hey, don't let that door close, who's responsible for not letting that door close? The person I'm speaking to. It's their choice. It's their decision. Now, if I tell them they don't let the door close and the door closes, they didn't respond to what I asked them to do. God is asking you and requiring of you, but never will manipulate you or, or be a little puppet on a string as a puppeteer. He's challenging you because he wants you to live a certain way because it reflects your heart condition. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And in verse 13, he says, do not present your members as instruments unto unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That word instruments means weapons. It means to, to now as a child of God to present yourself, uh, to, to train yourself. As, as Paul later wrote, as, uh, he talked about a boxer that would shadow box and an athlete that would prepare. We're to be in a preparation to use what God has given us as weapons in the spiritual warfare that we're to go out and do battle with the forces of evil and to go out and try to win as many lost to know Christ as their Lord and Savior as we possibly can. Part of that comes through them watching you, but the most part is, is you speaking the Word of God. But listen, you speaking the Word of God and living something contrary, your actions will always trump your words every time. If somebody knows the way you live and you speak something differently, it cancels out whatever you have to say. That's why it's so important that as a Christian, you are set apart. You are yielding, submitting, controlling. If I use my hands, I'm, I'm in control. Now, unless I'm kind of diseased or, or something like that, I lose control. I'm in control of my hands. I'm in control. I can wave them. I can close my fist. I can use them to help someone or I can use them to hurt someone. It's all the intention behind that. And so he's saying to start using what God's giving you. In the righteousness of God. Verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Isn't that awesome? Sin has no more dominion over you because we've been equipped with the Holy Spirit as children of God. We have been equipped with a conscience, a, a guiding through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit inside of us, and an intellect to understand right from wrong and then capability of making a decision to live for Christ. Verse 15 says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? See, they can't get past it. Listen, this mindset is still a lot of the mindset in people today. They, they believe that because they're under the grace of God, they can live however they want to. That's not what the Word of God says. That's not what Christ taught. It's not what the, anything in the Bible speaks. And, and if you try to pick bits and pieces, you can form any doctrine you want to. But the Bible in and of itself in Wholeness is a victory, a freedom from sin to live a righteous and holy life unto God until the day he returns or to the day that you die. He asked, answers the question the same way in verse 15. No, no. 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves, slaves to obey. You are that one slave from you obey. He says, from whom you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. There is a difference there. There is an a obedience to sin that doesn't lead to, uh, at least to death, and there is an obedience to, uh, leading to righteousness. And in verse 17 it says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin. That's past tense. That's past tense. Everything about someone in sin and being in sin and living in sin in the Bible, yes, we were all sinners. Yes, we all have sin. Notice the tense of those verses. You were these things. Uh, those things are in the past. As a child of God, you're to be living a different life. Uh, you're to be a changed individual. Uh, yes, uh, there may be an occasion in your Christian walk where you slip and stumble and you get up and you, and you ask for forgiveness and you move on. There's a difference in, in stumbling and living in sin. There's a difference in someone who sins and someone 
someone who's a sinner. Uh, there, there's a difference in the Bible. Uh, we can talk about this all day long. Go read your Bible. There's sinners, there's saints, there's unrighteous, there's righteous. There's, there's the unholy, there's the holy. The biggest difference is, is sinners go to hell, the unrighteous go to hell. But the righteous and the, the, the saints, that's what you are if you're a child of God. You're not perfect. Uh, we should strive every day to live a life free of sin. But if you're a sinner living in sin, there's something wrong in your life. There's something that you need to, to remove from your life. Listen, skip on down to verse 21. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? That's a laundry list there. That's, that's pulling out somebody's skeletons in the closet. He's asking you as an individual, what things in your life, what fruit did you bear as a lost person, as someone living in sin, that now as a child of God, knowing right from wrong, knowing what God commands, knowing what's expected of you, he says that, that, you now, that you're now ashamed of, that you that you're now uh, have, want nothing to do with. He says in verse 20, For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in those things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Knowing now the end of the life that we were living is death. Aren't you so glad that Christ stepped in, intervened, offered you a way out, and that you came under the burden and, and answered the call to salvation? And now, now the things and the fruit that you're bearing should lead unto life and not of death. Because verse 22 says, but now, but now having been set free from sin. Listen, there's so many verses that talk about a Christian and their freedom from sin and turning from sin. I don't know how anybody can pick and choose a verse or try to twist something in the Bible that ever says the Bible says it's okay to live in sin. Nowhere. I challenge you, if you find that in the Bible, any teaching in the Bible that says you can live in sin, please show it to me because I don't know it exists and I, I doubt you'll ever find it in, 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 a, in, a, in a good translation. Because everything in the Bible says that we're to be free from sin. But it says, verse 22, But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. You see, there was things that we did when we were lost or when we didn't know any better, that, that we were bearing fruit, we were giving an evidence of things that, that led to death, but now we're slaves to God and our fruit is to holiness. And the end is everlasting life. You see the difference? There's fruit unto holiness that is given to everlasting life. And then there's fruits of things that, that were uh, in the past that led to death. He's talking about sin and the things of our life. Because Romans 6.23, you could probably quote this verse. This is one of the main verses in the, the, the road to salvation that many people preach out of Romans or teach out of Romans. Romans 6.23, for the wages, the, the earn, the uh, compensation, uh, what you get for sin basically is death. Not a physical death. We're all going to physically die one day. That's something that, that's on this earth that's, that we have to deal with because of Adam's sin. We have to die a physical death. Sin entered into this world. We, we live in a, a creation that's been tainted with sin. That's a consequence of Adam's sin all the way back. But listen, your sin is what you're going to be held responsible for. It's your choices that you had to answer, you'll have to answer for. No one ever put a gun to your head and said, you must do this. We all chose to do certain things. Listen, you may have been misguided in the past. And when, 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 when trying to be guided with the Holy Spirit say so you shouldn't do this, maybe a voice in your head from somebody says, well, you can't help it, or, or that's just human, or, or, or you're under grace. Listen, all those things and all those false teachings that quench the Holy Spirit, what seems more like God? Turning from sin or it's okay to sin? You don't have to be a, a, a rocket scientist to figure this out. If the Holy Spirit screaming inside of you to turn from this, but then you really remember it, or you're trying to pull things out from your memory to ease that conviction, that's not of God. The, the thing that's of God is to tell you to turn and to, to flee like, like uh, uh, Joseph. And when the wife grabbed a towel, he just ran out the door because it was the fastest way to get out from the temptation. And he left a towel in her hand, and, and he went to prison for that. But listen, I'd rather go to prison an innocent man in God's eyes than to be living on this earth and be standing one day guilty in God's eyes for my sin. Listen, we're going to close. Go to, go to Ephesians chapter 5. There's a sacrifice in the way that we should live. There's a, a challenge to holiness. Dead to sin and alive to God. The opposite would have to be true. Alive to sin would be dead to God. 
Look at Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at seven short verses and then we're going to close. Ephesians chapter 5, he says, he's continuing this, this, this uh, theme that he's, he has in Romans about how we're to uh, uh, walk in Christ. And how did Christ live? He, he walked in love. But then verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, verse 2 says, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And he says that's the way we're to walk, in love, in, in the love that we have for Christ and, and to obey him. But then he, then he starts in verse 3, but, but he's going to contrast some things. He's going to say this is the way you should walk, this is the way you should live, uh, but just in case you don't know what I'm talking about or what you should turn from, I'm going to list some things out. He says, but, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. As if fitting for saints, neither filthiness. That, that word filthiness, it means obscenity. It doesn't mean a, 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 an outward filthiness. I mean, you know, we all get dirty from time to time. If you go out and you work, you sweat, you get dirty. That's not what he's talking about. These are, these are not physical or, or outward or, or a, uh, uh, things that dealt with the law like the Pharisees. These are all moral issues. These are conditions of your heart and your conscience. Now, a filthiness means the obscenity. Uh, there's a lot of obscene things out there in the world today. There's obscene jokes. There's, there's uh, obscene movies. Everything that, that's out there. Stay away from it. Nor, nor foolish talking. Uh, nor coarse jesting. That's, that's uh, vulgar. Uh, to be vulgar. Uh, listen, there's a whole other message about what comes out of your mouth uh, as a representation of what's in your heart. But it's plain here. Uh, this, this vulgarity should never come out of a Christian's mouth. Uh, a vulgar joke should never be the, the topic of conversation between uh, any Christian or anyone. And if you're around that, you should leave. It says, which are not fitting. They're not proper. They don't fit into a Christian's lifestyle. Uh, if there's a change in your life, these things just don't fit. They're not proper for you. But rather, but rather giving thanks, giving thanks. For this you know that no fornicator or unclean person, again, morally unclean, uh, in sin, living in sin, uh, someone who, who is continuing in sin, not have sin or not uh, uh, committed sin, but if they're living in sin, if they've justified sin in their life and they've become numb to the grieving of the Holy Spirit, they become numb to the, the, the sharpness of the Word of God and they've justified things in their life, they've become numb to this, they've become morally unclean nor a covetous man who is an idolatry. Listen, none of those has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He says, none of those. Now, you can try to interpret that however you want to, but there's only one way that that can be interpreted. If you don't have any inheritance with the kingdom of God, it means that those people without repentance and trusting in Christ shall not see heaven. And there's only one alternative to heaven that we teach, which is hell. Verse 6 says, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Listen, there is a multitude out there being deceived by some ear tickling that's going on that people will just tell them what they want to hear because they just want, to, they just want you to come back. They just want you to grow. Listen, the challenge of any pastor is to get someone to grow spiritually, uh, to challenge them in this world. It's getting harder and harder to preach this word. And, 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 to, and to get people that, that want to hear and that want to live because there's so much out there that's so appealing. It's, it's almost like that forbidden fruit that, that's just made so desirable. And I'm saying, well, you can't have that. And so uh, you grow up in church. Well, you can't do these things. And someone, you know, there, there's that ploy of the devil. Well, well, does the Bible really say that? You know, it's the same thing he did with Eve. Does it, did he really say you couldn't eat that fruit? And then along comes someone, instead of standing on the Word of God, and saying, you, shan't do, you shall not do these things, uh, the the Word of God says against these things. Then you get someone say, well, that's okay. I mean, you're just human. You're going to sow your wild seeds. You're going to go out and do something. And then all of a sudden, there goes the inhibition, and they're off into sin. And the Bible warns of these people. Verse 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Empty words. Unless they're God's words, they're empty words. We can't preach what I think, what I want to believe, or what I say should be. We have to preach what God says. And it says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things... What things? All the things listed up here. All the things that, that, that encompass sin. Because of sin, it says, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Are you a child of God or a child of the devil? That's what it boils down to. Are you living for the Lord 
Are you living for the world? Are you yielding unto obedience, which leads to life? Or are you yielding unto disobedience, which the Bible says God's wrath is stored up for the sons of disobedience? Verse 7 says, therefore, do not be partakers with them. There's a cost to following Christ. There is a separation from this world. There's a separation maybe from people. There's a separation from things on this earth. There's things that, that, that God wants to deal with you and, and remove from your life. There is a cost to following His example. Not a Twitter following. Not a Facebook following. Not, not opening your Bible every now and then and saying, oh, let's just go back and check and see what Jesus did just to follow some things that He did. No, it's a following that changes your life to where you want to obey and live as He lived and to be alive to God, which means to be dead unto sin. Can you do that? Yes, the Bible says you've been equipped through the Holy Spirit. The only challenge is today. It's just like asking someone to hold the door open. God's asking you to live for Him. God's asking you to obey Him. God's asking you to be a child. God's asking you these things. He's not forcing you to do these things. So the decision is yours. The very first decision is, listen, if you've never made a profession of faith, if you never, never have gotten on your knees understanding that I have sinned. Everybody in this room has sinned. Uh, Everyone has sinned. And there's an age of accountability. There's there's an age at which a child knows right from wrong. Have you ever noticed when a child starts being embarrassed about running around naked? You 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 ever notice that? A kid can grow up in a house and they can never be told it's wrong not to wear clothes. But at a certain age, they'll become embarrassed and they'll want to have clothes on. Where does that come from? There's an age at which a child knows right from wrong. There's an age at which he can understand or she can understand the accountability of their sin. And at that point, they'll be held accountable for the sin in their life. But until then, there is a forgiveness. There is a grace that falls upon them. Uh, But for us as adults sitting here today, whether you made a profession years ago and maybe you've kind of uh, been misguided and misled and you've let sin creep into your life, there's a time to get that out, uh, that when we stand before God, we stand before Him with, with a clean hands and, and clean hearts. That's the time that, that's now for you. But for someone who's never professed, never understood what it means to be a Christian, now's the time for you too. All it takes is trusting in Christ or repenting of your sin. You want to be reborn? You want to start a new life? Christ is the only one that can give you that. It only comes through a relationship with Him. But it starts first with a repentance, with a humbled heart, with a brokenness in sin. How do we know that? We have to understand what is sin in our life. This Bible was never meant to justify anything in your life, but to expose what was wrong in your life. It's like a mirror. When we look upon it, we see something wrong, we fix it. When we look upon this Word and there's something wrong in our life, God's asking you to fix it. God's asking you to turn from that. And He's given you everything you need through the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. So as we close in song, what are we going to sing, Jay? 317. 317. Listen, maybe this is just an opportunity. Maybe God's challenged you in a certain life. Listen, uh, I'm not saying that uh, salvation, the Bible says that you're to work that out. Uh, it would be so much easier if, if, if a little dot or a little something, a little cross would pop up over somebody's head. Wouldn't that be awesome? If, and he's, oh, I'm not worried. Praise God. You're so, and then you go target the people that don't. And, so, and, and then it'd be maybe levels of spirituality in their life. And you could go look at somebody that's on the E. Or, well, their sin had crept in their life. We need to go encourage them and challenge them. And so what you have to do, you have to preach this message, not knowing who needs it or where someone's at in their spiritual life, and then trust that the Holy Spirit will work in their heart and their mind. Listen, that part's up to you. Uh, I, I can't um, finger someone out specifically because I don't know where you stand. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit with His Word. So my job is complete in the presenting, in the challenging, a, a, as true as I can to His Word. The next part is up to you. It's just like I can ask somebody to hold that door. God's asking you today. If something in this message has spoken to you, God's asking you to take action upon what He's asked. It's up to you. It's not up to me. Uh, it's not up to anybody to shove you, take you by the hand, straighten out anything. That's up to you. That's what, the, that's what this challenge is all about. God's message and then a response from the people that want to respond to God, that want to be alive to Him. That's where the response comes from. It's not a manipulated. It's not a forced. 
It has to be a willful, a, a choosing out of a love for Him. That's what this altar call is about. It's not about coming down. And it's a time of maybe repentance for some, a rededication for some. Hopefully, if there's someone here that's lost, maybe a time of salvation. But the choice has to be yours.